Good morning, church. Welcome. Welcome to those with us online, on the patio, and here in the worship center. Welcome to everyone. We are glad you are here worshiping with us. If you are new or haven't connected us with us in a while, you can text NEW to 805-979-2003. You can also scan on the back of the seats. There's a QR code. You can scan that and we will connect with you. Or also, we are at Connection Central, so please join us after service. Let's prepare our hearts to worship. Please stand if you are able to. Well, good morning, church. Today we're gonna be talking about what it means to be the church, and the reality is that you are the church. Whether you're here or you're watching at home, God has chosen you, empowered you. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession so that you can tell others about the goodness of God because he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So whatever the church is, and let's be honest, she is a mess sometimes. This morning, let it be a house of joy because of all the Lord has done for us. Amen. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. As he opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today.
show your glory to us, we pray. We are here just to seek your holy face. Jesus, we are desperate for you to rend the heavens, to pour out your spirit on all flesh like you promised. Jesus, we're not here for a social gathering. We are here because we believe that you are the king of the earth, and we want to look to you and honor you as such. And so, Jesus, this morning as your people, we come to remind ourselves of your goodness and your glory and your faithfulness and your truth. Would you empower us by your spirit, we pray this morning as we just honor and glorify you. It's in your name that we prayed and all God's people said, 
Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Amen. We serve an amazing God. And just as he is good to us, we shall also be obedient. I would like to invite the ushers forward. Well, this morning when you walked in, there was different, there was something different in our lobby. There is, we are for the next four weeks, we are hosting a ministry fair. We will be highlighting different ministries in our community. What's important about these ministries is these ministries show the goodness of God in our community. And today we begin a new series, Tove, which means good. And so with, within our ministry fair, we will, be, we will be having back there, there is Child Evangelism Fellowship and they, have, they share the gospel with children. In Lucy Amar, they are in nine of the 11 elementary schools and they're looking for help to support and open in those last two schools and in help in strengthening the other, the other teams. So go back there, speak with them, learn more about them. And one parent shared that Good News Club has helped their children, has created principles and has changed their life. And so you can get to know more of the stories that parents have encountered with the volunteers in the back. And so we invite you, we remind you, church, that the church is not a building. We are the church. And we will be learning more about that through Pastor David's message. Well, good morning, New Life. It's so good to be together, whether you are gathered here in our sanctuary, whether you're on the patio, whether you're at home, we have moved from the scattered community to the gathered community that we might experience the goodness of God, that we might express the goodness of God. There is something just good when you identify something that is good. I know that's super profound, right? No, 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 it's really not. But think about it, like, like when you take a bite of a chocolate covered strawberry and the juice is dripping down your chin and you've got chocolate on your fingers and you take that bite and it's sweet and good and wonderful and especially if it's made right as God intended it with dark chocolate, not milk chocolate, <laughs> it is good and you just identify as good or like I didn't know, like I didn't know. I grew up in the Midwest and, uh, and there's plenty of ways that you can cook a steak but there is something about a steak or a piece of meat that's cooked over oak that just hits different. It just hits different and that, that flavor just is better and I didn't even know what I was missing until I came to the Central Coast. And when you, and when you eat that, you go, this is good, right? Or, or you're down at the beach and, and you, you're kind of down there with the family and you're sitting around and you, and you build a fire on the beach and you've got, you know, s'mores going and the sun's going down and people are laughing and carrying on and, and kids are kind of passing the, the football over to your left and you, got, you see a couple people doing kind of, uh, which I didn't even think you were, again, I I'm, I'm, haven't been on the Central Coast very long and haven't lived near the ocean. I was always taught you don't, you know, go into the ocean, during, you know, when it's dusk or dawn, right? You don't do that because that's when the sharks are hungry. And, uh, but apparently that's when you surf also. And so you got surfers in the ocean and you've got the sun going down. And it is, you just look around and you take in with all of your senses and all of your vision and all of your sight. And you simply say that this is good. Will you turn to somebody near you and say, this is good. Because when it comes to the Hebrew word of tov, that's exactly the types of things that, that the word means. When, it's, when, when we translate tov good, it is something is very well done. It's a masterpiece. It's actually fulfilling its purpose. 
And so when we go to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 specifically, we find this word tov used seven times during the creation account. And so as God creates everything, he simply says it is good. And so we, if you read through it, in fact, this is also interesting, seven times he speaks this. If you know anything about biblical literature, um, numbers have significance, and seven is the number of completion or fullness or of purpose, right, of wholeness of purpose. And so seven times throughout the creation account, God creates something and then says it is good. He looks at it and says, this is good. He takes what once was chaos, darkness, the sea. The sea throughout scripture is looked at as chaotic and sometimes utilized to represent evil at times. And God takes that, is, that which is chaotic, that which is dark, that which is formless, that which is void, and he creates good. He speaks and says, let there be light, and there's light. And he saw it, and it was good. Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Then he creates the land and the sea, and in verse 10, he says, it is good. He creates veg vegetation and plants, verses 9 through 13, and says, he steps back and says, all it, and said, it is good. He creates the sun, the stars, and the moons, and they begin to fulfill their purposes, and he steps back, and he sees it, and he says, this is good. He creates the fish, and the seas, and the creatures of the land, and the birds of the air, and then the animals, and he says, this is good. Then he creates humanity. He steps back, and this time he says, this is very good. Or as we've been saying around the office, this is totally tove. Totally tove, right? <laughs> you, some people are going to use that, right? This is totally tove. Totally tove. Now, what's interesting is, and this is what's so important for our conversation over the next couple of weeks and as we study God's word, while morality may be a part at some level of calling something good, within this biblical text and the narrative and within the, this idea of tov, it is not talking specifically about morality. And oftentimes when we talk about good, we think of it in moral terms as in good and bad. But in actuality, when we use the word tov and we understand the word tov as being good, it's not about morality, it's about fulfilling its purpose. And so when God created light and, called, and saw that it was good. He wasn't making a moral statement about light. He was making a purposeful statement about light. Light was doing everything that light was created to do. And when he created the land, land and sea did everything that land and sea was created to do. When he created the birds and he created the, the fish of the sea and he created the animals, they did everything that they were supposed to do. And in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it's a short history, but in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, when he created created humanity, humanity did everything that humanity was created to do, so therefore it was all good. But in Genesis chapter 3, all of a sudden things are not good. And the reason that they are not good is because we tried to determine the purpose of humanity and the purpose of creation, we decided, hey, you know what, God, I know that you have the purposes and plans and the things that you want us to do, but we're not too keen on that. We want to do our own thing. And when humanity did their own thing, that's when sin enters the world and things become a mess and things break down. And yet God, in his redemptive purposes, from... Genesis chapter 3 on, through the coming of Christ in the New Testament, you see God redeeming the purposes and plans that he had for humanity, the plans and purposes that he created us for so that once again he could say, it is good. And so even when you think about Jesus, I think some people have, again, if you're just exploring Christianity, if you're just looking at God for the first time, if you're just kind of thinking about these things, sometimes when we think about Jesus, we're like, man, I want to be like Jesus because he was good, meaning he was a good little boy. And I want to be more good, do more good things than bad things. And that's how we tend to think about Jesus. But in reality, 
when, when God looks down and, and he says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, in who I am looking at, and he is good, he's saying, this is the prototype of what humanity is supposed to look like. Jesus wasn't just a good little boy. He is the prototype of, hey, this is what you were supposed to look like, humanity. This is the way things were supposed to look. This is how you were supposed to relate to me and how you were supposed to relate to one another. And it and he is good. And so the church, as the body of Christ, a question for us is, when God looks at the church, does he say, oh, it's good. See, we are the physical representation empowered by the Holy Spirit of Jesus here on earth. It's why we refer to as not just the church, but the body of Christ. And again, something I'm going to be referring back to throughout this series is when God sees the church. And even more specifically, when God looks at this local body, does he step back and say, yep, that's what I created it for. That's what it's supposed to look like. This is Tove. This is good. So how do we know what that purpose looks like? If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter is in the New Testament or the second half of the Bible. If you go to the very end of the New Testament or towards the end of the New Testament, you'll find 1 Peter. It's a little short book, so you'll have to maybe kind of flip through a couple of times. First, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 9, we read about what the church looks like when it's good. But you are not like that. What are you not like? You're not like you used to be. You are not like the things of this world. You are not like those who live in sin and brokenness. Why? Because God has redeemed you. He has restored you. You have placed Christ at the center of all things. He has brought about his salvation. He has brought about his redemption. And because you are not like that, now you have to understand who you are. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. What does it look like when the church is good? What does it look like when the church reflects the goodness of God? When, when God looks down and says, yes, this local body, this gathering of people, this community declares the goodness of God. One way to look at it is like this. If we, when we gather together, and when we gather together, not in just large groups and places like this, but when you gather at home in smaller groups, when you gather on the patio, when you gather uh, in schools and workplaces and, and places around this community, when you gather together to break bread at one of our local restaurants, when you gather together, when people see the church gathering, wherever two or three are gathered together, when the church, when the people see the church gathering, is it evidence of God's goodness? Like, do they look at it and say, God must be good? Because the church was created to declare the goodness of God. And so when we are living into the fullness of our purpose, and what God created us for and gathered us for, People should say, that's good. That's Tov. And one of the very first things you realize as you're reading through this passage is that the, the, it's, it's declared to a plural group of people, a community of people. You guys have probably heard me say this at several different types of passages because it's important to no notate because when we see you, we think singular me. But the you in here in this passage is a y'all which it means we, y'all are people who are chosen people, y'all are a, a royal priesthood, y'all are a holy nation. And so what's happening here is that God is taking the chaos of people who don't get along together, who have different opinions, who, who are Jews and Gentiles, 
who see things differently. And he is gathering them together around the headship of Christ and the salvation and forgiveness of what Christ has done. And he is emplacing in them a new purpose, which is that they are a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And so he's gathered these individuals together. So think about it like this. If in the book of Genesis chapter 1, things are formless and void and chaotic, and out of that, God creates light and land and sea and humanity and says it is good. Now flash forward to 1 Peter Chapter 2, verse 9, and things are chaotic and people have different opinions and different political backgrounds and different ways of seeing things, and it's chaotic and formless and void. And he says, I'm going to create this people group into a holy nation, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, so that they may declare my goodness. See, the scripture is a communal book. While I love many things about the Protestant Reformation, one of the downsides is that everybody got the Bible, so everybody got to hunker down in their, in their own little world and read the Bible by themselves and never have to interact with one another, never to have, to have conversations about how this, how the words of Jesus were not just shaping me, but shaping we. How we were being transformed by the words of God. Did you ever notice that when we look at the words that Jesus taught us to pray, that he didn't teach us to pray my father. He taught us to pray our father. Forgive us, right? When you get to the Apostles' Creed and, and, and the creedal Orthodox creeds of the, of the church, they're communal in nature. I'll be honest with you, it'd be actually way easier it would be way easier if God would just let me do my thing with him and read his word and be on my own. It would be way easier. But when God looks at us and says, and, and, and we're like, hey, this is just a me and God thing. This is just an individualized thing. This is just me and my own spirituality. When God sees us operating in that way, he doesn't say this is Tove. And it's not a morality statement. It's a purpose statement. He says, this is not Tove because that's not what I created the church for. I didn't create it for you all to be a bunch of individuals doing your own thing, reading your own thing. I created you to be a people who would declare my goodness. And the only way that you can declare my goodness is when you're interacting with one another, when you're forgiving one another, when you're one anothering one another, forgiving and caring and carrying each other's burdens and having mercy on one another and creating space for one another. Then God can look at us and say, this, this, as messy as it is, as difficult as it is, this is Tov. See, it's a modern idea that it's just Jesus and me. If you go down throughout church history, it's always Jesus and we as we follow him. This is what God had in mind. He says, we are royal priests. We, not just me, we are a royal priesthood. Again, we professionalize the clergy, we professionalize the pastor to where somehow we think the royal priest is the one who's standing on the platform and preaching and teaching and doing the sacraments. But the reality is that we are a royal priesthood, which means we have responsibility to represent God to the world, not just me. Meaning wherever you go, wherever you eat, wherever you work, however you're parenting, wherever you're at at school, you are a royal priest. When you walk in, wherever you walk, wherever you go, wherever your feet take you this week, you are a royal priest. And so you have responsibility. What did priests do? They represented God to the people. They interceded for the people. They communicated the truth of God. They, tr they communicated the mercy of God. They communicated the forgiveness of God. They would pray for people. They would pray for healing. They would pray for reconciliation. 
They were the ones that would show up and they would get their hands dirty. Did you know that a priest's role, one, of the, one role of a priest was to go and when somebody was declared unclean, they would have to go to them and they would have to check their wound or check the abscess or check the thing that was making them unclean. And then they would have to help journey with them so that they would become clean. We are a royal priesthood. You, me, we are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation set apart. Set apart where God has given us a purpose. Set apart where God has said, hey, this is who I have called you to be. Do you know in the early parts of Genesis, that's one of the disconnects where we, where we read about, hey, it, are we going to choose to be about God's purposes or our purposes? When the people gather together and they build the Tower of Babel, they are not about God's purposes, they are about their purposes. But when God comes to Abraham, and says, I'm going to make you a holy nation. I'm gonna make you the father of many nations. I'm gonna set you apart, Abraham. Abraham embraces God's purposes. Set apart. You're not just tove, you're also weird. You are, like we're, we're weird. Like you're here on a, Sunday morning, you're watching on a Sunday morning, you've got, you're sitting in the cold on the patio, on a, you're weird. <laughs> you're weird because you lead with forgiveness and mercy. You're weird because you believe in a man named Jesus who wasn't just a man, but he was the son of God who died for your sins and was raised after three days from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father and one day we'll return and make all things new. You're weird. Like, like if you talk to someone, we, we're in the ninth most post-Christian area in the, in the nation. There's a lot of people who have never heard the gospel. They've never heard the word of God. They've never heard the story of God. And if you told somebody, hey, hey, do you want to come with me and gather together? Why do you gather together every week? Well, we gather on Sundays. Well, why do you gather on Sundays? Because we gather together to worship a guy who was raised from the dead. Let that soak in for a moment. I know some of you grown up in the church, it makes sense to you, but man, if you're hearing that for the first time, people are like, I'm, I'm surfing on Sunday morning, <laughs> right? Because it sounds odd. God has set us apart so that we can declare his goodness and how we walk and how we talk and how we live in alignment with the ways of Jesus is vital to who we are as ones who are set apart. Do we walk in the ways of Jesus? Do our words drip with the words of Jesus? Do our hugs communicate? Our compassion communicate? Our care communicate? the goodness of God, because that's supposed to be the result. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, not so everybody can say, woo, look how holy those people are. We are a royal priesthood, we are a holy nation so that we can declare the goodness of God. So when people see you, when they see us set apart, when we speak the good news, when we declare the good news, when, we, uh, when compassion and mercy and forgiveness flows from a community where Christ is at the center, people would say, I think there may be a God, and that God must be good, because look at his people. It's a communal manifestation of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, still on earth. You know, you hear people say all the time, man, if I would have seen Jesus, I would have known. I mean, like, when we look at Jesus, we say, there's somebody who is good. And again, not just a good little boy, but look what, look at the way he cared for the poor. Look at the way that, that, he, that he healed. Look at the way that he restored. Look at the way he invited the outsiders to be insiders. Look at the way Jesus was. And when we read the scriptures, we say, man, Jesus was good, he was tov, he was, he was fulfilling the purposes of God. And the question is, if we are through the power of the Holy Spirit, the representation of Jesus still here on earth, does the world look at us and say, that's tov? In fact, maybe even taking a step further, do people look at the church and say, there's Jesus. There's his hands and his feet still, there's his his words still, there's his hug still, there's his compassion, there's his mercy still, there's his forgiveness still. 
that looks like Jesus. When people look at the church, do they, specifically when they look at new life, do they say, there's a community who, who's experiencing and declaring what it looks like to be loved by Jesus, to be shaped by Jesus, and to literally go and do the things that Jesus did. That's not, I hate corporate terms. That's not a vision statement. That's not a, that's not a marketing statement. That's not a branding. It's us asking deep questions about who we are as followers of Jesus and saying, who do we wanna become so that when God looks at us, he says, oh, that is Tov. That's what I created the church for. And so what happens on the flip end or, or the opposite end of the conversation? What happens when the church isn't good? What happens when the church isn't good? Well, first of all, we lose our way. We become something that we weren't meant to be. We are like pineapple on pizza. It, I know, I just offended a whole lot of people. But, but it just shouldn't be. Like nobody, nobody should look at pineapple on pizza and go, that's tove. That's what it was meant to look like. But we lose our way when we become something that we were never meant to be. And if I can be quite honest with you, church, specifically over the last three years, but I would say over the last 15 to 20 years of my ministry, I have watched the church slowly become something that it was never meant to be. I watched it become corporations. I watched it become an organization rather than a body. I've watched it become about the pastor rather, rather than the community. I've watched it get po politicized and for politics to commandeer the church for its own purposes. Can I tell you something? The purpose of politics is to win. The purpose of the church is to redeem. Those are very different objectives. <laughs> and so we lose our way. We lose our way. We should be speaking into the world. We have to speak truth to power. We have to declare the goodness of God in the gospel. The celebrity-driven culture. Do you know, no matter how good I was telling Pastor Philip this this morning. No matter how good we preach a message on a Sunday morning, no matter if you had the best preacher, no matter if you're watching the best podcast, the best preacher, think of the best. If, you, if, if Billy Graham's your person, if whoever your celebrity preacher, like you love to listen, when they preach their best sermon, do you know God looks at that and he doesn't say that's good? Because it's incomplete. The best sermon the best worship leader, the best song set is incomplete because it's about all of us. But we've made it about a person or a message or a sermon or a song. And you know what that allows us to do? Sit back and observe. And that's not Tov. That's not what the church was created to be. That's not who we are called to be. We are the body of Christ, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are hope to the world. We, we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God leads us to declare his goodness, to redeem, to restore, to heal, to bring about justice and truth and reconciliation in this world, to declare the good news of Jesus. What happens when the church isn't good? We cause hurt rather than provide hope. And sometimes that hurt is from unmet expectations. And sometimes the unmet expectations is again because we have so sent around one or two or three people that there's no way that we can care for all people. And sometimes it's when sin happens in the church. And if you're new to the, to the life of the church and, or maybe you're kind of coming... 
Some of us have experienced sin. And you know what the worst part of sin in the church is that people begin then question, well, well, if I was baptized by that person or if that person led me to the Lord, then, then you start questioning whether or not your baptism was real or whether or not your salvation was real. You came to the church because everybody else had let you down and then all of a sudden the church lets you down. And it hurts. And as much as maybe I have tried not to hurt people along the way in my ministry, I'm sure I have. I'm sure, I know I have. And I know I've let people down. And I know I've frustrated people. And I know we as New Life at times have, and I know certain decisions I make people don't like. And I think at times, rather than trying to justify it, we just need to confess and say, I'm sorry. We have to own when we fall short of being tov. It's not our intent. It's not our desire. It's not the trajectory we're aiming for. But it happens. And I don't know if it was from our church or it was maybe from another church that you might be coming here now. But on behalf of the Capital C Church, if you've experienced hurt at the hands of the church, I simply want to just say, forgive us. Forgive us. We're sorry. And the grace and forgiveness and mercy of God through Christ Jesus is enough to redeem. It doesn't mean it doesn't still hurt. See, if we're going to become tov, if we're going to become something that God says this is good, then we have to own where we've had bad. Have you ever tried to start a relationship or to become something without dealing with what your missteps were? And for some of us, on the other end, we have to, we have to experience that healing. We've got to, at times, even take off the hurt lenses because what can happen is we can begin to see everything through our church hurt lenses and just assume that things are being done from a particular motive or a particular way. And so for some this morning, we have to take off those hurt lenses and we have to set them to the side and put on this idea of who we are becoming as a people who God looks at and says, this is good. And ask, how do I, how do I participate in that? How do I help a community become that? If you're somebody who's been hurt by the church, I also want you to know that there's space here for healing. I'm gonna talk here in a moment about participation. Sometimes before we can participate, we need a season of healing. And so if you're in a season of healing, we wanna give you space to do that. And if you're open and willing to talk about it, we'd love to journey with you. And the church isn't being good, we value consumption over transformation. What do you have for me versus how do I be made new? What do you have for me? What what ministries do you have for me? How good is the music? How good is the preaching? How good are the programs? Rather than, hey, we're gonna choose to be a part of this community as a family because we believe that Christ is at the center of this community and because Christ is at the center of this community that our family will be transformed, that our lives will be transformed, that our relationships will be transformed, that I will be transformed by the power of God by being a part of this community. You can get the best podcasts, Best sermons, best worship set, best music ever with a click of the button right now. The church has to be something more than that. 
I believe God created it to be more than that. Fourth, when the church isn't being good, we fight the world rather than be a part of redeeming the world. See, sometimes it's really difficult for us to see people through our culture because our culture looks so different than what we read in Scripture. And so we have a really difficult time seeing people through our culture. But if we strip the culture away from our lenses, what we would realize is there's a bunch of image bearers of God in our culture. There's a bunch of people who God is, wants to redeem and restore There's a bunch of people who God wants to introduce to his forgiveness and his mercy. There's a bunch of people that God wants to forgive and invite into relationship with him. There's a bunch of people who are hurting and in need of restoration. And so I know for some people when I say, hey, there's people who are in need of restoration, that that sounds offensive, but it's true. It's true. The other end of the things that sometimes happen is we hunker down. Redemption is about engaging others. Hunkering down is about avoiding others. When you read the gospels, when you see Jesus moving about the people, is he avoiding others or is he engaging others? And so as the church, if we're gonna say who we are and who we are called to be, if we are the body of Christ, Jesus' is physical representation empowered by the Holy Spirit still on earth, are we called to engage or to hunker down and avoid? But I get it. This can be absolutely overwhelming, right? Like, how do we be the church? How do we actually do this? We were talking about it this past week, and, and I was telling people how I was getting ready, which I still haven't done yet, put, to put away my Christmas decorations And at some point, like, it feels so overwhelming. The reason I haven't done it, it feels overwhelming, right? Like, you're looking at it going, oh, I've got to get out all those boxes again, and then it has to be organized, and it has to be put away, and it's just going to be a big hassle. But you know how you put away decorations? You start with one. (laughs) One ornament. Next one. The next one. And five hours later, you'll be done. And so when I think about sometimes how it can feel overwhelming to say, hey, what does it look like for the church to be good, for the church to be toved, for the church to, to, to authentically reflect Christ to the world? When I think about that, it can feel overwhelming. And then I remind myself, it just begins with starting somewhere. Starting somewhere. And as I was thinking about where we as a church should start I thought about two different areas specifically, and then I'll talk about something that we're going to do corporately. The two things that we need to do specifically is one is healing, and one is repentance. And when it comes to healing, again, while you've heard me talk a lot about we, God redeems individuals and invites them to be a part of communities. He doesn't redeem individuals so they can stay an individual. He redeems individuals so they can be a part of a community. And so when we talk about healing and and repentance, I wanna talk about the individual right now because there are individuals who are here who need to experience the healing of the Holy Spirit in their lives because they have been hurt by the church or they've been hurt from a spiritual standpoint and they are stuck and they're observers, and they're kind of Jesus and me on my own because I'm too afraid to engage, and healing has to take place. And when I talk about this, I want you to know that the type of healing that has to take place is as miraculous as when somebody is healed by cancer, or from cancer. I had a buddy this past week um, who's in Michigan who he was getting ready to go have a tumor removed, cancerous tumor removed, and we've been praying for him, and he went for his last um, pre-op scan, and when they went and they scanned his body, there was no more cancer there. He was healed. 
And yes, we should celebrate that. But I hope over the next few moments, there are some people that are healed from church hurt and we should celebrate that just as much because it's just as damaging and it cuts people off from the body. And so if you are somebody who has been struggling because the church has hurt you, I'm gonna lead you through a prayer here in a moment and I just invite you to experience the healing of Jesus because he wants you to engage and he wants you to be a part of a body. And we, we are less when you're not a part of it. Yes, you can come and observe, but we are less. We are less when you're not a part of it. And then for others of us, it's a time of, of repentance. Maybe the repentance says, hey, God, forgive me for sometimes being so fixated on my political party that I lose sight of my calling as the church. Maybe it is, God, forgive me for chasing after celebrity pastors and preachers rather than having my eyes fixated on you and the calling and plans and purposes that you have for my life. Maybe it's, God, forgive me for sitting on the sidelines and critiquing rather than contributing. I'm just being real with you this morning because until we level set and we have healing and repentance, we will never become tov. It's impossible. We will continue just to kind of sputter along. And maybe as gnarly and as awful as the last three years have been, maybe just maybe, as God always does, he brings beauty from ashes. He takes that which is meant for evil and creates tov or good out of it. Maybe just maybe the last three years was not just for new life, but for the capital C church to say, we have lost our way. And we wanna reclaim our purpose. And we wanna be something that God would look at and say, this is tov. And it begins with healing and it begins with repentance. So I want to pray for us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you, God. God, I pray if there are those this morning that are gathered here in the sanctuary, on the patio, find themselves at home. God, I pray for your, the healing and the power of your Holy Spirit to wash over from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet every nook and cranny, every place where they have been hurt, every place where they have felt let down, every place where they have questioned the plans and purposes of the church, every place where they have seen sin, every place where there should have been healing and restoration and yet they received hurt and anger. I pray for the person who because of maybe sin or brokenness or something in their life that they have always felt like the church has held them on the outside rather than inviting them in to experience the healing and restoration and goodness of God. Forgive us, God. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us, God. Forgive us. Forgive me, God. I know, whether it is intentional or unintentional, I know that I have caused hurt and strife in people's lives. Forgive me, my trespasses. God, I pray your healing would just wash over people right now. That they would take off their hurt lenses. And they would place on lenses that say they are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And then, God, I pray for those of us that need to repent. You can love somebody without repentance, but it's impossible to have a relationship with somebody without repentance. And so, God, if we as the body are, are called to be 
a holy nation set apart, a chosen people, God, there's going to have to be some repentance. Forgive us, God, when we haven't listened, God. Some of us need to repent because when, when other people have said, hey, I'm hurting, we blew them off. When some people said, this has been my experience, we said, no, nah, that, that's not true. We need to repent because sometimes we've looked to other messiahs rather than the messiah, Jesus. We've placed our trust in organizations or political parties rather than the body of Christ in the kingdom of God. And God, we desperately want to reflect and declare your goodness to this world. So God, we repent. Forgive us and turn our gaze and our eyes on you once again. We ask all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. And so if you've been at New Life very long, you know that I, I think sometimes it's important to have a physical response to something that God's doing in us spiritually. A physical response to something God's doing us spiritually. And so we're going to sing uh, two songs of worship. And as we do that, I've asked some of our, our team, or some of our staff to, and our prayer team to come to the front, and they're going to have some anointing oil. There's nothing mystical or magical about anointing oil. It is simply God's active presence. And we wanted to create a way where, hey, maybe you experience or are, are, are desiring to experience or moving towards healing from church, or maybe you did some repenting today, and maybe there's more that you you feel like you need to dive into. Maybe you just simply want to say, hey, I've been sitting on the sidelines. I've been consuming. I've been observing, but I haven't been being a part of the body. We want to invite you during this next worship time, the next few moments, to come forth. And they will simply just place the cross of Christ on your head because Christ is, at, is the head of this body. I am not the head of this body. Christ is the head of this body. And he wants to mark you. Mark you as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession who will declare the goodness of God wherever you go. That is not my identity. That is our identity. And so as you come forward, they will simply say, you are, have been marked as Christ's church. So as we sing, I invite you to sing along, to come forward, to continue to pray at your seats, but allow the Holy Spirit to continue to do his work this morning. God, we come. May our worship be sweet to your ears. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name.
Well, during this last song, let's just remind ourselves of the presence of God that is here with us. Remind ourselves of the goodness of God, where he's shown up in our lives. Just bring back to memory those moments, even yesterday, last week, where you felt the presence of God, you felt the grace. Let's just worship.
as you leave today, some of those ministries that we are highlighting this month, some of those ministries that are partners with us here at New Life are right outside those doors. If you're looking for a place where God can utilize your gifts and graces, I'd encourage you to talk with them. If you are interested in partnering with them uh, in any capacity, I know they would love to talk with you. We want to let you know that beginning tomorrow, we are entering into 21 days of prayer as a community. Um, tomorrow night, our every actually every Monday night um, during 21 days, uh, Pastor Philip and our student ministry will be leading a time of prayer uh, in the student center. You can see that from 6 to 8 on Mondays. Then on Thursday mornings at 9 a.m., our team, our staff usually gathers in here for prayer. We wanted to open that up to the entire church. If you have 9 a.m. available and you want to come and gather and pray with us here at 9 a.m., we'd love for you to do that. And then throughout the week on social media um, and in the e-news, you'll be seeing some prayer prompts ways that you can intercede. And the reason why you are called to intercede is because you are a royal priest. And so intercede for our community and intercede for our nation and intercede for families and intercede for healing. I know of some stories right now where people are praying for a miracle of healing. And we as the church, as the royal priesthood, are called to intercede for those individuals. And so as you go, do not walk out those doors as less than you are called to be. As you leave, may you leave in the fullness of who God has called you to be. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are of God's own possession. And as you go, may you declare his goodness, his tov, wherever you are. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And amen. Grace and peace to you. Hope to see you next week.